Hello, everyone. It's Philip Lee returning with another edition of uh, Civil War Chat. Today is uh, December 19th. We're in the week heading toward Christmas. So uh, I'm going to do a little story about Christmas today and the Civil War. But uh, to subscribe, click on the subscription button here in the lower right and also the notification bell in the far upper right to be notified when each new uh, episode is released. And so today, let me begin with a Civil War historian's Christmas dream. One February night in 1938, Philip Van Doren Stern had a dream. I have one of his books about Robert E. Lee. He is an author of a number of Civil War books. But anyway, like most of us, his morning memories of that dream were vague and conflicting. But the 38-year-old Civil War historian also had an interest in fantasy and the macabre, to which the dream seemed somehow connected. The story had something to do with a man who had never been born or wished he had never been born. Stern decided to promptly write down his recollections. A narrative began to take shape which grew into a story he titled The Greatest Gift, and it actually took him a number of revisions to get there. A finished tale leaves many of us with a renewed appreciation for everyday relationships that we have come to take him for granted. Stern's story failed to interest a publisher over the next four years. Consequently, toward the end of 1943, he printed 200 copies at his own expense and enclosed one in each Christmas card envelope he mailed that year. One recipient was a Hollywood agent who asked if she might show it to some of the studios. To Stern's surprise, RKO bought the film rights for $10,000 in the spring of 1944. By December, Good Housekeeping Magazine finally published this short story. Hollywood screenwriters set to work on a film script until the essence of Stern's fantasy shrank to the third act. Eventually, it would pass through nine writers, including Joe Swirling, Francis Goodrich, Albert Hackett, Dorothy Parker, and Frank Capra. After Capra, purchased RKO's rights for $50,000. Capra is also the producer and director of, or he was the director of Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. So he has many of those inspiring type of stories uh, under his belt. Nonetheless, the movie was finally released in 1946, but it fell short of break even on its first run. It rose to 26th place in the 1947 box office receipts. Although nominated for five Oscars, it failed to win any. Thereafter, the rights passed through a series of owners, ending up at Viacom. During the 1970s and 80s, local TV stations began to run it during the Christmas season. They exploited it as an opportune low-cost programming show that they could put into time slots not allocated to network shows. Gradually, it gained a fan base. I think it may actually have lost its uh, copyright, which made it a particularly low-cost programming alternative, but I'm not sure of that. Anyway, in 1984, an agent, Frank Campra, commented, that the film's rise in popularity was, quote, one of the damnedest things I'd ever seen, close quote. He felt like, quote, the parent of a kid who grows up to be president. But it's a kid, it's the kid who did all the work, close quote. He never expected his kid to become president. In 1998, the American Film Institute ranked It's a Wonderful Life as the 11th best movie of all time and rated George Bailey as its ninth most popular hero. 
Now, in novelist Andrew Claven's analysis, Dickens's, Dickens and Dickens, the author of The Christmas Carol, Christmas Carol and his movie Scrooge, and Stern's It's a Wonderful Life are essentially mirror images of the same story. A Christmas Carol is one image. It's a Wonderful Life is the opposite mirror image. Scrooge is a man grown rich because of heart shriveling greed that is forced by spirits to view the consequences of his own existence. Conversely, George Bailey is a man in financial trouble because of his large souled generosity who is forced by an angel to view the consequences of his non-existence. In other words, what would have happened if he had never been around? On both sides of the mirror, the results are the same, a revolutionary personal transformation. In both cases, the circumstances of each man's life do not change. Instead, it is the men themselves who change. So you might want to watch both of those Christmas stories. And if you want to get a Christmas gift, consider some of my books on the Civil War. You can see them all at my author page on, uh, at Amazon. But the special gift might be uh, the audio version of causes of the Civil War. For those of you that don't like to read, but would rather have somebody read it to you so you can listen to it in the car or what, wherever you might find it convenient. The audio version of causes of the Civil War might be something you wanna consider. Okay, so with that Christmas story, I'll leave you until next time. Thanks for watching.